Let's get started. Welcome to Foundations of Christian Worship. It's fall semester 22 course. My name is Teresa Berger. I'm Professor of Liturgical Studies at uh, Yale Divinity School and the Institute of Sacred Music, and I'm anchoring the course this fall. We have a teaching fellow, Dr. Ian Sager. We'll do introductions um, towards the end uh, of the session. But today I want to begin uh, this introductory session by doing essentially two things. The first one is to introduce you to the object of study in Foundations of Christian Worship. And with that, uh, the questions and the vision for intellectual inquiry into the practice and history and theology of public communal prayer in the Christian tradition. And I want to do that by trying to respond to a basic question, what is worship and why study it? Second, towards the end, we'll take some time uh, to also talk about some details of this fall course and answer questions you might have about readings and requirements, uh, who your companions on this journey through the semester are, and, and all these other good things. The way in which I've patterned this introductory session is in part due to the fact that the class is being recorded, not you, but me, for posterity. The Center for Continuing Education at the YDS is opening up some courses that are taught at YDS to be viewed online later on. So we need to think through how to get through materials but also make sure that you are the priority in this fall semester. I think Tanya, where is she behind the mask, who might be taking this course, might also be the recording uh, wizard for this semester. So let's just all cooperate and see how we can best uh, do this. But before we enter into the work of this first uh, session, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, this particular moment. Uh, we are starting the fall semester, beginning this class. Some of you might already have come from morning prayer, uh, either at your kitchen table or over at St. Ronan's. Some of you will be in Mark 1 Chapel later this morning. Some of you may be aware that uh, today in churches around the world, we begin a relatively new season uh, in those churches that keep uh, liturgical seasons, uh, the season of creation. And today, September 1, is the World Day of Prayer for the Care of Creation. All of this, in a sense, turns on a fundamental insight into the practice of worship, or practices of worship, which is what we'll be studying this semester. And the insight, in a nutshell, is this. Worship is not worship until you do it, until you actually worship. And to honor that basic insight, I want to begin today with a prayer, and I invite you, as you are able, to enter this space of prayer with me. The text is Psalm 63, and I'll be praying with reading from the New Grail translation. I'll explain in a second why. I've chosen that. Let us pray. O oh God, you are my God. At dawn I seek you. For you my soul is thirsting. For you my flesh is pining like a dry, weary land without water. I have come before you in the sanctuary 
to behold your strength and your glory. Your loving mercy is better than life. My lips will speak your praise. I will bless you all my life. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul shall be filled as with a banquet. With joyful lips my mouth shall praise you. When I remember you upon my bed, I muse on you through the watches of the night. For you have been my strength. In the shadow of your wings I rejoice. My soul clings fast to you. Your right hand upholds me. Amen. Why start with Psalm 63? From the earliest centuries, and this is basically a plea for um, appreciating scripture and especially the Psalms as um, a liturgical book, as not only ancient texts, but texts that have been alive in the worship of Jewish and the Christian communities uh, for many centuries. So if we look at Psalm 63, not through, let's say, historical critical lenses, what's the sitz im Leben of this particular psalm, but look at it through the lens of liturgical scholarship. What do we learn? Well, we know that since the earth from written sources, that since the early centuries, we begin to have sustained records of this by the fourth century, Psalm 63 is a common morning psalm. To cite just one reference, Saint Basil the Great, we are in the fourth century, said if there were a perfect prayer to be prayed in the morning, this Psalm 63 would be it. And that tradition of Psalm 63 anchoring uh, forms of morning prayer continues uh, into the Middle Ages and then in churches that have scripted uh, liturgies, particularly of daily prayer, it continues to this day. It can also be a night psalm. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. You might have caught a reference to the night watches and meditating on God through the watches of the night. But Psalm 63 became a morning psalm because of a peculiar word at the beginning of the psalm that from most contemporary English translations has disappeared, which is why if you only read contemporary, um, especially scholarly translations, you will miss 2,000 years of liturgical history and the reason behind this psalm being a morning psalm. So I am not kidding myself that most of you can read the Hebrew with ease, but I highlighted the one word that made this uh, for many centuries um, a, a preferred psalm for the morning. And it is a word that mostly now is hidden um, because uh, in the complex in translations, um, because it has several possible meanings. Most translations nowadays will uh, not follow the Hebrew root of the word shahar, uh, but translate the um, form in which it appears here as a version of seeking eagerly. 
Behind that word, though, is the Hebrew word for dawn, which is why the older translations will often, and the new great translation that goes back to that, will speak about seeking God in the morning, or first thing in the morning, rather than seeking God eagerly, which means the psalm could be read at any point during the day, which of course you can still do. But the Greek and Latin translations in which the Psalter is uh, a tradition uh, throughout time in many churches, not in Syriac communities, I'm aware of that, um, renders uh, the psalm verse as referring to the morning. And so it becomes for centuries um, a morning psalm. So first thing to take from this is that liturgical readings of biblical texts um, require some instruments that the way biblical courses are typically taught in divinity schools may not offer you. That doesn't mean those courses are invaluable. It just means liturgical studies looks at uh, biblical texts, particularly texts of prayer, which many of the Psalms are, with a specific lens. The second thing to note about not only Psalm 63, but uh, Psalms more generally, is that their transmission in liturgical history over the centuries comes not only as texts, but there is a materiality and a sonic life to these psalms. Um, if you have time and visit the Beinecke, you can take a look at some of the fabulous medieval manuscripts and psalters that um, are in the Beinecke. I brought along, just for show and tell, a contemporary psalter. Um, and you'll see it's a book, um, it's a handwritten psalter. It's a book by its sheer size that is not meant for you to carry around in your backpack and pull out when you have a moment to read a psalm. It's a book for um, meditation, for public reading. I used this Psalter when I first came to Yale Divinity School 15 years ago and had to give the opening convocation address that this time President Salovey did. I used this Psalter to speak about one of the Psalms. So there is a specific materiality to biblical texts as liturgical books. That is different from what you see on the screen is the um, Hebrew Bible uh, as we had to study the text in divinity school. Uh, there is nothing particularly liturgical and artistic uh, about that production. Okay. In case you think we'll we'll stay with Psalm 63 for the rest of uh, today and dig into the history, not the case. I just wanted to give you a concrete example of um, a um, uh, an actual prayer text and b what liturgical studies as a scholarly inquiry may help us to appreciate about this text of prayer. A last note uh, that Psalm 63 I think helps me make is this. Foundations of Christian worship is not a how-to course. In other words, I don't think there will be too many sessions where you can uh, directly say Oh, now I know how to pray better. 
more, more attentively. Um, it's, um, the course is um, an inquiry, scholarly inquiry, into liturgical studies. But that doesn't mean that that cannot deepen your own prayer life and your own lives of worship. I've certainly found for myself that liturgical studies as a scholarly field has done that a million times over. Okay, so much on Psalm 63. Oh, I forgot uh, one thing. Um, if you look at the psalm more closely, there are actually in the psalm embedded pointers to liturgical practices. I just highlight a couple because from the Hebrew text, uh, most of you will not be able to pick that up uh, quickly. If we translate the um, beginning verse as referring to seeking God at dawn, uh, that might refer to a particular moment that in uh, the ancient Near East is actually and continues to be marked uh, today as a specific moment of uh, worship, not only in Israel but beyond, namely the sun rises. And the response of creatures is what? It's to turn to the Creator in praise and prayer. But um, there isn't enough information embedded in Psalm 63 to make that clear. Verse 3 is clearer. I have come before you in the sanctuary. So clearly this person praying, the psalm identifies the prayer as David, um, is entering into God's presence in a built sanctuary. My lips will speak your praise. With joyful lips I will praise you. We assume there is a sonic element there. This is not just a quiet interior meditation. There are sounds that accompany and are this prayer. And there is a bodily engagement. I lift up my hands in prayer. Finally, um, there is a fleeting reference uh, to a part of the sanctuary uh, hidden to most folks in the English translation, unless you know your temple furniture well in ancient Israel. For you have been my strength in the sh shadow of your wings, I rejoice. This is probably a reference to the creatures above or on the side of um, the ark. So embedded in this psalm um, are pointers to actual ritual practices. And that's, of course, what liturgical studies is peculiarly interested in and will gravitate towards. Now, the task at hand. What is worship and why study it? <clears throat> Let's begin with some basics. This, of course, is a biblical reference, but it might be hidden unless you think about Genesis 1 and uh, John 1. So, we began with this already, worship is not worship until you do it. What that means, if we translate it, is that worship is a practice, an embodied practice in time and space. And that means it is always more than texts. That's of crucial importance for communities that are profoundly text-bound in their liturgical practices. 
And for when here I'm not referring to the scriptures, um, all Christian communities are text bound in that sense, that the scriptures are the most important liturgical book for all churches, no matter which stripe. Um, but to remember that worship is always more than text is particularly important for those ecclesial communities that are heavily invested in scripted uh, liturgies and textually scripted liturgies. Think um, Episcopalians and Anglicans and the Blessed Book of Common Prayer. Uh, think Catholics um, with a Missal and the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, so any community you might be a part of that would gravitate towards liturgical books other than the Bible uh, to think through its own liturgy and to govern its liturgical practices uh, needs to remember that worship is more than text. There are Christian communities that have always known that. I uh, think of Pentecostal and charismatic communities even Hispanic Catholic communities uh, are not overly uh, text-based other than the Bible. That does not mean that their liturgies aren't scripted. Um, they are scripted, uh, often in uh, quite uh, sustained ways. Um, so a Pentecostal worship service, you can script in a ritual analysis. Um, none of it is governed by a book that says, here is how to do this. But it is tradition and scripted in particular ways. So as an example, you typically don't have someone singing in tongues first thing in a worship service. You also don't get an altar call first thing. It comes after a number of things are in place. So there is a clear script, but it's not governed by liturgical books. Is, is the distinction clear? Okay. Um, I think what I've said before is already makes this clear. Worship involves time, space, body, senses, gestures, movements, voice, music, silence, and voice materiality, and text, and probably a couple of other things I have not put on the PowerPoint. So it is a multi-sensory, multi-material practice. I'd say more in a second about the fact that this is not how liturgical studies was taught when I entered the field. Um, it was very much a text-based scholarly endeavor. Uh, you studied liturgical texts. Um, we've moved away from that. Not that you never study liturgical texts. Uh, Psalm 63 is a liturgical text. But that's not always said. Okay. Uh, liturgy, some of you I would put money on come from uh, churches where you have heard explications of the term liturgy and fervent sermons that make much out of the Greek roots of the two words that make up the word uh, liturgy. Uh, Laos, the people, and Ergon work, and uh, the homiletic uh, message is often liturgy is the work of the people, so everybody participate actively, get involved, raise your voices. Um, yes, <laughs> that's not wrong. Um, historically, um, it's not the primary meaning of 
liturgy in the early centuries. It actually often referred to someone, often someone of means, um, putting on an event for the people. So be somewhat cautious when you overwork the two Greek terms that hide behind the term finish. Now, what is counted in this field? And I will admit to being someone in the field of literature who wants to count as much in as I possibly can. You might hear other colleagues. It's a very richly diverse field who will map it differently. So don't think what I put out there is the only way to theorize this. It's one possible way, I think a very good way, to think about what is counted in liturgical studies. First, the obvious, it's all public communal gatherings for worship. So yes, forms of morning prayer, Psalm 63, Sunday services, Quaker meetings, daily mass, Compline, which is a night service that some of you might be familiar with, uh, weddings, funerals, ordinations. So the gamut of established worship practices in any uh, specific community of faith. It might also include rituals with uh, what I call fuzzy spiritual edges. Think of opening convocation at YDS uh, two days ago. That's a ritual with, uh, in my mind, uh, quite fuzzy spiritual edges. There is a reading from scripture. Um, there are prayers and hymns. Uh, the ritual as such is really governed by academic protocols of the North Atlantic world. You might be surprised to know that the scholarly context out of which I come, and Tanya also, um, got rid of uh, academic vestments with uh, essentially modernity. <laughs> so it's, a, it's somewhat strange to come into a scholarly context and see them live on. <laughs> okay, that's a side note. Um, the upcoming 9-11 memorials um, might also be some of these rituals with fuzzy spiritual edges, um, so-called disaster rituals, uh, and a host of other things, um, especially with the ascendancy of a kind of diffuse spirituality culturally. I think you see an increase in rituals with quite fuzzy spiritual edges. They might actually have always been there, just not as visible. I leave that for later um, explorations. What has often not been counted in in the field of liturgical studies uh, are congregational gatherings that are not strictly for worship or in atypical sites. So prayers at homecoming picnics, in food kitchens, shelters, in refugee camps. Um, people are beginning to study these from a ritual studies perspective. Uh, but um, it's still not uh, a strong part of the field of liturgical studies. And then non-congregational prayers, for example, in the home, in the woods, this is of increasing importance. There is a whole network of wild churches uh, emerging that uh, gather um, not in a sanctuary built by human hands, uh, but outside. Uh, the whole huge area since COVID uh, of liturgies and digital social space, and so on and so forth. 
Finally, broader Christian uh, ritualizing such as practices of popular piety and devotion. Uh, think of uh, Hispanic devotion to the Virgin of Guadalupe uh, on December 12th. Um, think of um, emerging ritual Eco, eco rituals, ashes to go, pet burials, you name it. Again, it's that's a burgeoning field, and, and many of these, if you think of pet burials, you might have never actually practiced one or witnessed one. If you have children, you might. Uh, but it's also a lively. Um, um, part of YouTube uh, ritual moments. So, now the scholarly fields that are under what is here a day called liturgical studies. The first thing to acknowledge is. Um, that there are other terms that float around as soon as you invoke liturgical studies. Uh, in Christian contexts, especially worship studies in more evangelically rooted uh, divinity schools, uh, you might encounter uh, that term. Is it a different animal than liturgical studies? Not really, they might focus uh, ritually on a different set of uh, <coughs> performances, uh, liturgical celebrations. Um, but here at Yale, we think mostly of liturgical studies and worship studies, of liturgy and worship as interchangeable terms. Now, that's a specific choice. If you want to read people who are adamant about making a distinction. Um, I recommend the study of liturgy and worship by uh, Juliet Day and Benjamin Gordon Taylor's quite Anglican evening. There is nothing wrong with that. I'm simply naming it as such. And the first two chapters make a strong argument of why Worship is the broader term, it's essentially turning to the numinous, and liturgy is a specific, a more specific and narrow um, category. Let me just read you the key uh, quote, it's on page um, 14. Um, so the argument here is that worship, turning to God, is the prerequisite uh, for liturgy, it is the more fundamental reality, the, the response of the whole person towards God. The liturgy, in contradistinction, is a structured set of words and movements that enables worship to happen. I mean, that's not a bad argument. Um, so, if you want to maintain a distinction in your own mind, uh, read the two essays in this book that make that distinction. Um, liturgical studies is a quite open field in terms of scholarly arguments, and I have nothing against um, you holding on to a strong distinction between worship and liturgy. You just need to know how to uh, substantiate that, that argument. Okay. The third term that we need to figure in here is ritual studies. This is a field that emerged about 40 years ago out of liturgical studies in um, an attempt, a successful attempt, to think through rituals even religious rituals without theological a uh, theological line of inquiry added into it. 
So you can map um, Pentecostal worship services, the Roman Catholic Mass, processions, simply by the tools of ritual studies without having to adjudicate faith claims or truth claims. Ritual studies you will find mostly represented uh, not in divinity schools, but in, um, uh, in wider areas of the university. That said, the tools that ritual studies as a field has developed have also become tools within liturgical studies. So if I want to map, for example, um, a Pentecostal worship service simply as a ritual event, my tools would be those of ritual studies. Once I go into questions such as how is the Holy Spirit present and encounter it in this ritual structure, I have moved into theological terrain, and ritual studies would not necessarily want to do that. Okay. And then uh, we have a whole slew of what we might think of as cognate disciplines in liturgical studies. I think this is what most um, drew me to this field of scholarly inquiry and has kept, kept me in it happily, uh, that I get to do all the things that fascinate me. Biblical studies, theology, historical investigation, practical questions, congregational studies, and then you add in social sciences, so for example sociology, um, I just listened to a presentation last weekend on um, congregational life after COVID and what simple sociological analyses can tell us. And the picture is not pretty, um, but it needs to be figured in when we think about worship. There's cultural studies, art history, gender theory, performance studies, environmental humanities. Essentially, you can claim almost any discipline as a, a cognate field, as a field to be in conversation with. So what that means is that liturgical studies is just about the richest interdisciplinary field uh, imaginable. And um, it has to do with us not, with us studying practices and studying them through, uh, through history. Okay. Now, I want to suggest a, a heuristic image to think a bit further into uh, the scholarly work that is literature studies. And I'm inviting you to think with the category of seeing. I know that with that emphasis, I privilege sighted people. And I also bypass the dominant emphasis of the Jewish and Christian traditions on hearing. Shema Yisrael, listen Israel. God speaks, God creates through the word. So there is a dominant emphasis in the Jewish and Christian traditions on the word. I'm not trying to push that aside. I'm just inviting you to play with, work with, uh, the category of seeing and the sensory perception of seeing. First thing to acknowledge is that um, as human beings, uh, in comparison with other creatures, some other creatures, we are limited in our seeing. The dragonflies, which is what these 
Hello, sorry. Um, have eyes that are able to see a much vaster range of the real uh, than we are. So any kind of invitation to seeing has to acknowledge, first of all, that simply as human beings, our sight is limited. Even before you figure in a doctrine of the fall or sin or human weakness, our seeing is limited. Okay, now to a, just as a comic relief, uh, in a sense, a, a fun exercise. So let's think of liturgical studies as um, seeing, as a way of seeing, a disciplined way of seeing. What do you see? I'm really asking a question, but I also know that with the masks on, I may not even hear your answer. Yes. And I'm really no. <laughs> there is a liturgy geek in this class. <laughs> um, it's a liturgical umbrella, yes, um, that typically belongs in the Catholic tradition, at least in a basilica. Uh, as an indicator of um, the ties of this Basilica to the Vatican. You might think, oh, give me a break, this is so arcane. It is. But um, odd Catholic uh, minutiae aren't the only place where ritual umbrellas uh, figure in actual liturgical performance. Um, here is uh, a liturgy in an Ethiopian Christian uh, community of faith, and there is a ritual use of umbrellas in uh, certain uh, communities. That ritual use of an umbrella had actual liturgical functions. It shielded um, a presider and liturgical books from possible inclement weather when we still had processions um, or celebrations that included uh, rituals, uh, have ritual parts outside. I think if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a while ago that I was at St. Gregory's of Nyssa in San Francisco I think they resurrected uh, umbrellas in liturgy. Anybody who's been there recently? Okay, so I can claim whatever I want to. <laughs> um, but then let's move into contemporary worship design. I came across this, uh, uh, the, which was labeled the best stage design for worship with umbrellas. Okay, I would bet money on the fact that none of these worship designers realizes that there is a long tradition of liturgical umbrellas uh, in, in the Christian tradition. So, liturgical studies, um, I guess that is the takeaway from these three images, is a really intriguing um, field of study if you want to make it that. Now this is not the art of liturgical studies. Obviously we have more important uh, things to study than umbrellas in worship, um, but especially if you travel a lot uh, you find a lot of these little things that are related to uh, past liturgical practices that in some cases um, cannot but make you smile. Now, if we think of liturgy, liturgical studies as a disciplined way of looking, what do we look for? There are really three dominant approaches in the field. 
of scholarly disciplined looking. The first one is obviously the historical approach. What actually happened or might have happened? This sounds like a very easy approach. It is anything but. It's a really complicated endeavor, particularly if you move beyond simply studying texts. If you want to know what might actual liturgies have been like, none of us can go back in time to the actual liturgical celebration. We always work with witnesses to that celebration, be it texts, uh, be it um, architectural uh, remains, be it other materialities, vestments, um, art, instruments. So the historical is a key and very complex uh, approach in liturgical studies. Yeah, just a note of caution. I think we'll talk about that more as the as the class progresses. But liturgical studies is not a discipline to be misused for uh, um, evidentiary as an evidentiary grab bag. What I mean by that is. Um, and there are, uh, again, Christian churches that uh, tend more towards um, the need to have an authorizing past for something they want to authorize in the here and now. And so the search then goes, can we show that in the first few centuries they had something like this? Um, I have nothing against liturgical studies, uh, historiography that says, oh, I want to see how gender differences played into early liturgical practices. But then to assume that because X, Y, Z, we should today do X, Y, Z is, is too quick and utilitarian. Uh, I, um, an authorizing strategy. Okay, second, and this is where really liturgical studies parts ways with um, ritual studies in a sense. We do raise theological questions. So we are not afraid to inquire and search for the God-sustained truth in the church's worship. Again, this may sound clear, but it's anything but easy. Um, and then the practice-oriented, uh, what actually happens in liturgical celebrations, why does it happen this way in a particular context? Could it happen differently? Could it happen better? Um, so very much focused on actual contemporary needs and practices. How do we look? I think uh, my first claim would be that in liturgical studies, at least if you're a person of faith, you really move as you enter into this field of scholarly inquiry into worship from an implicit to a specific explicit look at worship. My claim here is this. Um, you of, often in the field, and I'm not adverse to that, will uh, read about a clear distinction between the primary act of worship, what we do when we enter 
and liturgical communities ritual. And the secondary act of scholarly reflection. Okay, and there are some snazzy Latin tags that uh, sometimes get attached to that. Uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, or theologina, theologia prima, theologia secunda. Fine. The weakness there, or what we need to guard against, I think, is to think that in worship, um, I'm purely in the mode of worship. I've left my brain at the church door. And all the critical apparatus, that is me. Well, I don't know how you worship. I have those moments when I feel as if I am nothing but pure prayer. But most of the time in uh, liturgical celebrations, Interwoven into that moment of pure prayer is, oh, I wish that person reading would know that proclaiming the word is something else than muttering under your breath. Or, why is she preaching on that text instead of another? I could do a better job. Or, wait, this isn't how it should be. So, you get the picture. I don't think our brains or our critical thinking is ever not a part of worship. So to make too clear a distinction between uh, the primary act of worship and our critical mind being active, I, I think is not helpful. That said, I do think that in liturgical studies, we move from an implicit thinking about worship to an expli explicit way of thinking about worship that includes scholarly tools. A second, um, we engage in liturgical studies with very conscious attention to the nonverbal dimensions of liturgy, to context, to questions of methodology. How do I best understand uh, this particular liturgy, let's say the Eucharist. What tools do I need? And not just the Eucharistic celebration of the community this Sunday, but where it fits in 2,000 years of Eucharistic celebrations that have taken very different forms and embodied somewhat different theological convictions. And of course, there are always questions of power involved in any kind of um, scholarly endeavor. I think liturgical studies also is, has to be done with uh, a self-conscious attention to both scholarly and to individual blind spots. So a scholarly blind spot for me might be that I don't know Syriac. Sorry, Efren, I think I may never actually learn it. But that's a useful language in liturgical studies. Um, and not only for the history, but there are communities that to this day uh, celebrate liturgy in Syriac. So that's a scholarly uh, weakness, I'd say. Individual blind spots. I was trained in Europe. Uh, I've been teaching in the US 
now for more years than I can remember. There are a vast number of communities worshipping around the globe that I'm not familiar with myself. And that's a, a, an individual blind spot. One needs to figure into the claims one makes and uh, the work one does. Uh, another note on individual and scholarly blind spots when we get into introductions. And then I think it's important always to have a view to the larger whole. So just a couple of um, visual aids here. This is a map of the internet from some years ago. Um, by now it's probably much more uh, intense still. But remember you live in a tiny, very privileged part of the global uh, family. And then in terms of your planetary home, <laughs> <laughs> we live on a tiny planet in a vast universe. But really what I want to point you to is the larger whole that is divine mystery. And certainly in liturgical studies as a theological discipline um, that has to be on the horizon always. And there are theological implications to this larger, this vision on the larger whole, we'll talk more about that later, but the fundamental would be that worship is something we are called into, and it is a spirit-sustained activity. As a human being, theologically speaking, I, simply, I cannot simply walk into God's presence. I would die. It is something that the Spirit calls us into. But with that, we are into deep, a deep theology of worship. We'll get there next week. So, how to see worship? Um, well, it depends on the lenses you are wearing or the eyes you have. Think of the little dragonflies. So there are different lenses through which worship can be studied. Some of them we'll encounter in this course, others probably not. There are the um, lenses of a historian, and liturgical studies needs, historiography needs historical investigations. But that is, uh, that is um, unquestionable. If it's the only thing you do, I, you don't need liturgical studies. You can be in a history uh, department and do ritual studies, I think. So a pastor will look at worship differently from a historian. She will worry about the community that gathers for worship, how to nurture this encounter with divine presence, and so on and so forth. More could be said. A church musician, again, 